What did you think was going to happen? Thirteen. The Woodman. There soon, however, appeared some drawbacks. In the first place, Malarka complained of extreme languor, the weakness that remained after her late illness, and she never emerged from her room till the afternoon was pretty far advanced. In the next place, it was accidentally discovered, although she locked her door on the inside, and never disturbed the key from its place till she admitted the maid to assist her at the toilet, that she was undoubtedly sometimes absent from her room in the very early morning and at various times later in the day, before she wished it to be understood that she was stirring. She was repeatedly seen from the windows of the schloss, in the first faint gray of the morning, walking through the trees in an easterly direction, and looking like a person in a trance. This convinced me that she walked in her sleep, but this hypothesis did not solve the puzzle. How did she pass from her room, leaving the door locked on the inside? How did she escape from the house without unbarring door or window? In the midst of my perplexities, an anxiety of a far more urgent kind presented itself. My dear child began to lose her looks and health, and that in a manner so mysterious and even horrible that I became thoroughly frightened. She was at first visited by appalling dreams. Then, as she fancied, by a specter, sometimes resembling Malarka, sometimes in the shape of a beast, indistinctly seen, walking round the foot of her bed from side to side. Lastly came sensations. One, not unpleasant, but very peculiar, she said, resembled the flow of an icy stream against her breast. At a later time, she felt something like a pair of large needles pierce her, a little below the throat, with a very sharp pain. A few nights after followed a gradual convulsive sense of strangulation, then came unconsciousness. I could hear distinctly every word the kind old general was saying, because by this time we were driving upon the short grass that spreads on either side of the road as you approach the roofless village, which had not shown the smoke of a chimney for more than half a century. You may guess how strangely I felt as I heard my own symptoms so exactly described in those which had been experienced by the poor girl who, but for the catastrophe which followed, would have been at that moment a visitor at my father's chateau. You may suppose also how I felt as I heard him detail habits and mysterious peculiarities, which were, in fact, those of our beautiful guest Carmilla. A vista opened in the forest. We were on a sudden under the chimneys and gables of the ruined village, in the towers and battlements of the dismantled castle, round which gigantic trees are grouped, overhung us from a slight eminence. In a frightened dream, I got down from the carriage, and in a silence, for we had each abundant matter for thinking, we soon mounted the ascent. We were among the spacious chambers, winding stairs, and dark corridors of the castle. And this was once the palatial residence of the Karnsteins, said the old general at length. As a great window, he looked out across the village and saw the wide, undulating expanse of the forest. It was a bad family. In here, its blood-stained annals were written, he continued. It is hard that they should, after death, continue to plague the human race with their atrocious lusts. That is the chapel of the Karnsteins down there. He pointed down to the gray walls of the Gothic building, partly visible through the foliage, a little way down the steep. And I hear the axe of a woodman, he added, busy among the trees that surround it. He possibly may give us the information of which I am in search and point out the grave of Malarka, Countess of Karnstein. These rustics preserve the local traditions of great families, whose stories die out among the rich and titled so soon as the families themselves become extinct. We have a portrait at home of Malarka, the Countess of Karnstein. Should you like to see it? asked my father. Time enough, dear friend, replied the general. I believe that I have seen the original, and one motive which has led me to you earlier than I first intended was to explore the chapel which we are now approaching. What? To see the Countess Malarka, exclaimed my father. Why, she has been dead for more than a century. Not so dead as you fancy, I am told, answered the general. I confess, general, you puzzle me utterly, replied my father, looking at him. I fancied for a moment, with a return of the suspicion I detected before, 
But although there was anger and detestation at times in the old general's manner, there was nothing flightly. There remains to me, he said, as we pass under the heavy arch of the Gothic church, for its dimensions would have justified its being so styled. But one object which can interest me during the few years that remain to me on earth, that is to wreak on her vengeance, which, I thank God, I may still be accomplished by a mortal arm. What vengeance can you mean? asked my father in increasing amazement. I mean to decapitate the monster, he answered in a fierce flush, in a stamp that echoed mournfully through the hollow ruin, and his clenched hand was at the same moment raised, as if it grasped the handle of an axe while he shook it ferociously in the air. What? exclaimed my father, more than ever bewildered. To strike her head off. Cut her head off? Aye, with an hatchet, or a spade, or with anything that can cleave through her murderous throat. You shall hear, he answered, trembling with rage, and hurrying forward, he said. That beam will answer for a seat. Your dear child is fatigued. Let her be seated, and I will, in a few sentences, close my dreadful story. A squared block of wood, which lay on the grass-grown pavement of the chapel, formed a bench on which I was very glad to seat myself. And in the meantime, the general called to the woodman, who had been removing some bows which leaned upon the old walls, and, axe in hand, the hardy old fellow stood before us. He could not tell us anything of these monuments, but there was an old man, he said, a ranger of this forest, at present, sojourning in the house of the priest about two miles away, who could point out every monument of the old Karnstein family, and, for a trifle, he undertook to bring him back with him if he would lend him one of our horses in little more than half an hour. Have you been long employed about this forest? asked my father to the old man. I have been a woodman here, he answered. Under the forester, all my days, so has my father before me, and so on, as my generations as I can count up. I could show you the very house in the village here in which my ancestors lived. How came the village to be deserted? asked the general. It was troubled by revenants, sir. Several were tracked to their graves. They are detected by the usual tests and extinguished in the usual way. By decapitation, at the stake, by burning. But not until many of the villagers were killed. But after all these proceedings, according to law, he continued, so many graves open and so many vampires deprived of their horrible animation, the village was not relieved. But a Moravian nobleman, who happened to be traveling this way, heard how matters were, and being skilled, as many people are in his country in such affairs, he offered to deliver the village from its tormentor, and he did so thus. There being a bright moon that night, he ascended, shortly after sunset, the towers of the chapel here, from whence he could distinctly see the churchyard beneath him. You can see it from that window. From this point he watched until he saw the vampire come out of his grave, and place near it the linen cloths in which he had been folded, and then glide away towards the village to plague its inhabitants. The stranger, having seen all this, came down from the steeple, took the linen wrappings of the vampire, and carried them up to the top of the tower, which he again mounted. When the vampire returned from his prowlings and missed his clothes, he cried furiously at the Moravian, whom he saw at the summit of the tower, and who in reply beckoned him to ascend and take them whereupon the vampire, accepting his invitation, began to climb the steeple, and so soon as he had reached the battlements, the Moravian, with a stroke of his sword, clove his skull and twine, hurling him down in the churchyard whither, descending by the winding stairs, the stranger followed and cut his head off, and the next day delivered it and the body to the villagers, who duly impaled and burnt them. This Moravian nobleman had authority from the then head of the family to remove the tomb of Macarla, Countess Karnstein, which he did effectually, so that in little while its site was quite forgotten. Can you point out where it stood? asked the general eagerly. But Forrester shook his head and smiled. Not a soul living could tell you that now, he said. Besides, they say her body was removed, but no one is sure of that either. Having thus spoken, as time pressed, he dropped his axe and departed leaving us to hear the remainder of the general's strange story.